You unlock this benefit with the key of Patreon. Beyond is another dimension. A dimension of thought. A dimension of speculation. A dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both waffle and substance. Of things and ideas. You've just crossed into the podcast zone. Well, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to our trek through the Twilight Zone. We've been going from episode to episode, giving our thoughts and opinions on each one in as short a period of time as possible, trying to keep it nice and the nuggets of information just for you. And we've reached the last flight. This is a time slip episode. So, Julian, what were your sort of thoughts on this episode? Um, I like this episode. I think this mm. is a solid episode. Um and uh you know it's just a it's a time travel episode but it's also about war and um you know manly courage in war uh although not not in a you know arnold schwarzenegger sort of girly man sort of <laughs> way but uh you know quite sympathetic what about you yeah no, i really like this episode i mean this episode again tapped into sort of like you know and oh, i'll get into it like you know specific phenomena that I, i'm aware of but also it made me think of like biggles um uh, and, and i actually just like the cast i and i like there are certain scenes in this that are just really well done uh when they're explaining to the pilot so basically a, a, a world war one british uh, pilot gets lost over france goes through a cloud and when he comes out of the side he lands on an american air base in 1959 traveling from 1917 to 1959 and they, they take him in and he's constantly looking around and he's like well we thought you were advanced boys but not this advanced <laughs> <laughs> and there's a couple of things like that which i kind of like and then when they're explaining it to him they explain in the, they explain the time and there's a guy i think he's i don't know what what rank he is at the major or whatever and the pilot sort of saying, "So you're not you're not joking, are you?" And he just shakes his head, like he's like, "No." And it's clear from the expression on his face, like I'm being sincere with you, but this is weird, like you know, mm-hmm. like. And it's a really like well balanced episode in that way because they keep there's two like there's like a um, like an air force, I don't know, general, or whatever he is, the sort of the the head of the, the of the base, and then this other guy, and it's like they're the main two uh, modern day characters. And I like how they're dealing with it. And they're constantly like, every now and then, even then, it's sort of really, they see this stuff. They see the uniform, they see the, the documents, they've seen the plane, and they're constantly seeing this evidence. But then they'll still come back and go, this, this can't be real, can it? Like they keep coming back to it. Like they're trying to sort of like touch base with each other, going, like, this is crazy. And they're like, yeah, but it seems to be like, it, it's, it's, it's made, you know, it's right. Um, well, what so, are you? I mean, yeah, no, it, it does. It feels legit, and and when they do touch base, it's it's sort of like you know you can tell they're sort of like checking in to go like we're not crazy, are we? No, fine. Um, and I like the reveal at the end, like yeah, the the whole sort of thing, like you said, this whole thing of going back to save his friend or his partner, you know, this his, his flying partner is is really well done. It's not it's not like you say overly macho. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just. Um, it, it's the realization that, like, so, just, so basically, there's a there's a flight lieutenant or some you know, big wig from there's the head, there's the head of the Royal Air Force at this point in '59, so the British head of the Royal Air Force is coming along the to Royal have the Flying Corps. Oh, you know, the it Royal wasn't Fla- the RAF yet. Well, the Royal Flying Corps in 1917, but when he's the guy who's coming to visit the base, oh, yeah, yeah. in '59, right. he's the head of the Royal Air Force, and um, he when he hears his name, he's like, well, no, no, he can't, be, he's dead. I've been knowing he left him to die. And then when he comes to the conclusion of like, well, no, he must have survived that dog fight. And he's like, well, the only person that could have saved him is me. Right. So I have to go back in order for him to live, to do this, this to, to become this. And so it, it, I, I like that. It all sort of slots together. And it's not never, it's never overly macho. There's never like a speech of like, you know, like, you know, even like that big Biggles kind of speech of tally ho boys <laughs> into the wild blue yonder. It's all it's all very sort of like you know me- it's kind of melancholy towards the end as well that sort of feel. So um, yeah, I, I I really like this episode. I was I was I really enjoyed this episode. Well, I'm glad. I mean, I think that uh, you know that sort of I'm a coward moment when Decker mm. blurts that is you know, part of sort of that first twist, right? That yes. you, of McKay, and that kind of culminates in that. And that business is quite great. Um, mm. You know, I, I think 
one of the things that I really like about this is that we sort of associate that with Vietnam and onward, uh, at least here. But, you know, the reality is, um, you know, that's been a part of every war in history is having to, you know, one of the things that we found out in Vietnam was that soldiers were not shooting at the enemy. I mean, that you know, they would shoot in the general direction, but they kind of don't want to kill anyone, you know, like yeah. unless you're in hand to hand combat and, you know, you need to kill the guy in front of you to survive, you know, you're firing off into the trees or something. And, you know, um, so but the fact that there were, you know, cowards in, you know, cowards, right, mm-hmm. quote unquote, in the, the First World War, which, of course, was a horrible, brutal mess from start to finish. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, of course, you know, I mean, the, the casualty numbers, you know, in the air were quite high as well. Um, and he even comments that he, uh, Decker does, that he has shot his own aircraft to, you know, yeah. make it seem more convincing. And I thought, yeah, this is quite, this is quite good. I like that this is shown as something that, is an issue in war and that he's not portrayed as an unmanly girly man, you know, who's, who's somehow, I mean, he is in a sense, morally deficient, um, but he's not condemned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, as well, you know, the, the, uh, the portrayal as well is never, um, <clears throat> that that match, I think, because he admits it. You know, he's, he, I like there's a, there's a conversation where he talks about this thing of like, well, when you're on the ground and you're playing cards and everybody's sort of like, you know, big each other up and we're talking about this and we talk about that. But he says, but then you get in the air. And he says, and that goes away. Mm-hmm. You know, like you are there and you're on your own and you know you've got to do these things. And it, 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 it's that admittance then that's sort of like, yeah, on the ground, it, we're all we're all brave on the ground. You know, we've all done this. But then in the air, like I say, he, he would discuss, you know, he would have them split up and he'd basically go sort of fly around in the cloud level to be hidden and mm-hmm. then come back. You know, that that's sort of it. Uh, and that's why he got lost in the first place. That's the reason for this all happening. And so I like I like that, that there's this acknowledgement of like, yeah, yeah, we're all full of bluff and bluster on the ground. But like, yeah, you it, he's like, you know, how have you faced up to this thing again? And so it's it's. It's an it's a real admittance that yeah no I I will admit that like, I've never been into war I've never faced combat I hope I never have to but again like you know it's one thing to be in the ground and be camouflaged and be firing from a certain place to be in a plane again don't forget this was 1917 like planes the first long flight or real flight was 1903 15 years before so these planes that they were flying over. Um, France in in the First World War were not sophisticated bits of kit. Like these biplanes were made of thin Absolutely. material, balsa wood. You know they were really not well made. So yeah, it's it's you know this this idea um, of going up there and, and doing dogfights and stuff like you know a, a lot of guys you know crashed more so, but not because of bullet strafes, but because they lost control of the plane or something would break in the plane. So. You know, um, yeah. You know, the joke is they were called the Twenty Minuters. If you've ever seen the Black Adder episode, the reason they're called mm-hmm. the Twenty Minuters is because that's their life expectancy. Um, and so, you know, th- it's acknowledged that it was a dangerous profession to be a pilot in the First World War. And so, I find that whole thing fascinating that he admits that, and then, but then has to go back and and you know, um, and then that finale when, it, like, say, the guy comes in um, and they have that conversation. And he's called Lead Bottom, and that was because he sort of he was always slow and all this other stuff. So it's 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 touching and it's interesting and it's weird and I lot I really enjoyed that. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that sort of final scene there between sort of the pot when he comes in there? Oh, I, I quite like it, and I, and I and I think you know again, I mean the dialogue is is real good. What's said and what's not said, yeah. and you know his personal effects and the fact that the Germans didn't have them. In fact, they're right here on this base. Mm. Uh, you know, the nickname Lead Bottom, um, you know, all of this is, you know, pretty subtly done, um, you know, and McKay's sort of uh, con- reconstruction of what happened in the air that day, um, you know, and along with that is, 
you know, here is this successful uh, air vice marshal. But he's aware of how his survival was predicated on other men dying. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, here again, what I really like about, I mean, the dialogue's good. That guilt, survivor's guilt, is real subtle, but it comes mm. through at the end. Um, you know, similarly, the sense of, like, how many, you know, in both of our countries, we have this sense of sort of, like, how many people have given their lives so that we could be here. Mm. And, you know, you don't have to honor that or think about that every day. But, you know, we... Um, we are beneficiaries of that in one way or another. Maybe not in my lifetime, because the United yeah. States hasn't been attacked except for 9-11. Um, but, you know, so I like that guilt. I like that. Uh, and I like that presentation of sort of even this great man who was brave, who did, was willing to take on, you know, the five planes, mm. uh, you know, owes his survival to happenstance and to, you know, the fact that, a, a guy helped him and died to to save his life. Yeah, uh, it, weirdly, sort of, you know, we said in the for the last episode, uh, the fever, how ham fisted that one was. Mm. You know, th- this is the exact opposite. Like, there's a level of subtlety in this, and again, like in fifty nine, like you know, again, there's not even like a British stereotype. He's not sort of like he doesn't jump out the plane and be like, "Tally ho, chaps!" Oh my god. <laughs> Oh God! Don't know what happened up there in the wide blue yonder. Crazy stuff. Like it's not that. Like he, you know, he's he's he still has a sort of like a weird optimism. Like I do like that moment when he's looking around, like he's driving around the air force around the air in his plane, and they've got the the jeep driving around him trying to make him stop. And he's looking around, going like, like bloody hell, this is incredible. Like the big <laughs> planes, like a jet plane takes off. Like yeah. it's. All that's, but it's never overplayed. Like he's never overplayed to be, you know. I think of like the Biggles or um, Lord Flashheart of Blackadder. Like it's not, he's not played to be bravado at any point. It's all subtle and well played and, and, and down to earth. And I, I think that's a really good choice that I really appreciate um, throughout this episode. Well, I think that's really important in war stories for yes. me. Um, I think it's. You know, lion. You know, lionizing these you know patent like heroes that never uh, give in and never surrender and never you know like I've been shot five times, but you know, uh, yeah. you know, uh, it's just pain. You know, you you know you're gonna die anyway, so you know you might as well die for your country. Um, and the truth is that people did throw themselves on grenades, mm. but they didn't do it with a heart filled with glee, you know, and they did it knowing that, uh, yeah, you know, uh, these are my buddies and, and they probably thought about saving them more than just killing the Hun or the Nazis, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah and so, yeah, so there, there is, there's a, there's a, as I said, there's a melancholy towards the end as well. Not just him, because he escapes the base. He's not let go. He escapes the base to go off. But even when you say when the vice marshal comes and gives that story, it's, it's not a, uh, a rah, 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 heroic story it's not to be told as a sort of like um it's almost like he's kept it personal until now he you know he's regaling the story but well no he's retelling regaling again sounds like it's giving it some sort of great glamour it's not it's a matter of fact it's like well yeah on the day this is what happened and it was tragic and that that's war um when it could have been again sort of like he came out of the blue like a you know like a flying (laughs) thunder but it's never that, and I, and I appreciate that it, it's never that. So again, I know I, I really like this episode. This episode, what I would say is as well, just as a, as a keynote, quickly before we go to final thoughts, there is a story. Again, I, I'm I'm quite into supernatural things at the moment, and I, I sort of, you know whether I believe them or not is a different story. But there is there is a an, an anecdotal story of a uh, uh, this is in mid twenties um, of a pilot over Britain going from one base to another. Uh, in a biplane, getting caught in a cloud, and then coming down to try and land at a base, but refusing to do so because the planes, everything at the base looked incorrect. When he flew down, the pilots were wearing the wrong uniforms, the planes looked wrong, and so he turned around and flew back. He reported this, 
everyone thought he was crazy. And then when the details were retold to the Royal Air Force, as it became in the late 20s, it was exactly as it was then. He'd actually flown, the alleged story is, he'd flown over a base that wasn't actually established until three years later. Um, and all this other stuff. So th this idea of the, 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 the time slip and the pilot is actually apparently quite common. And it's, again, there were stories of it in from World War Two. So I find that really interesting that, that, that this idea of the, the cloud and the time slip for a pilot you know, Rod Serling, whoever wrote this, clearly knew. It's clearly touched on these stories that have existed in the, again, the supernatural folklore or whatever. These legends of the, the air. But yeah, any final thoughts on from you, Julian, before we uh, move up, before we finish up? Well, I, I have a couple. Um, you know, your I thought thought, thought of nautical stories like that too. You know, that it's mm. sort of more familiar the sort of time slip uh, urban legends. Um, you said whoever wrote it. One of my final thoughts is. Uh, this was not written by Serling. You no. know, the last episode, not by Serling, was one of our worst, the Perchance to Dream. This is Richard Matheson, and he is based oh. on a short story by him. Um, so this is quite good, and it's a non Serling mm -hmm. episode. Um, and, and then my final, final thought is uh, if, the, if the Vice Admiral uh, accomplished great things and single-handedly won World War One, and you know maybe he went on to to you know be instrumental in World War II. Mm. All of civilization collapses if he's not part of the time stream. This episode would be called Yesterday's Enterprise. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah, and it, it does tap into those sort of things, doesn't it? That sort of the the um, it, there was one. It's from another thing, but you you and I have talked about time travel. Um, on stories like time and space, and this idea that you think of this song of, of you know the determinate uh, future, and and this almost fits into that. Like you know this this it's, guy, it's totally determinist, yeah. right? Because but because Matheson has survived when he first goes into the future. It doesn't rewrite time. He nope. always went back and died. Yeah. So um, so again, it fits into that sort of that idea. And I, I again, I like that, and that's why I noted that. Anyway. Yes, Father, that was a, a, a good episode. I really enjoyed that. And I, I didn't know it was Richard Matheson. I didn't check that, but I do like Richard Matheson. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. And as always, thank you very much for your support. We really appreciate it. And so uh, we hope you continue to listen, and we'll talk to you on the next episode.